Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Welcome to the Damage Report, everybody. It's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Craig just got back from vacation. It's very strange to me. John is gone. He is currently in St. Louis, Missouri, having this kind of a tradition of his where he eats pie for a week with his friend. I'll just let that one sit out there. Um, but we're here. We are joined by Michael Shore. Glad to be here. I, I wish I was eating pie, but not. who goes to St. Louis on vacation? I mean, St. Louis, lovely place. John does. Yeah, I know he does. He goes a lot. What do you do for Thanksgiving? I generally go to the East Coast and uh, I'm with family on the East Coast. I've traveled so much this year that I'm staying home and family's coming here. That's great. How do you negotiate that kind of a settlement? Because that, those are the kinds of terms that I typically use because it does seem like a fierce negotiation and no one's ultimately super happy it's, you do settle on something. Right, it's the, um, it, what it is, it, it's the, the notion that um, it, it's freezing back there. And so it's always easier to get you know, people here. But that said, I'd, I'd much rather be in New York. You wouldn't rush Manhattan, because you're from Manhattan? Well, I'm from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I don't like LA, and I, I don't like it at Thanks. holiday time. Well, I like you. No, thank I you. Like I you. like you very much. Yeah, but I, but I don't like it particularly at holiday time. Although when holidays are here, the traffic's fantastic. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. I breeze to work today. It's fantastic. And that's the, the seldom is a Los Angeles, uh, an Angelino. Right. You're going to have to learn these things, because you've only been here a dozen right. years. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's rare to hear people say the traffic is great right now. No, it's true. That's why Craig took his vacation last week, so he could come back to traffic free of Los Angeles. Craig, smarter than all of us, back from Seattle. Um, uh, this year for Thanksgiving, it was a whirlwind tour that just ended up with, uh, I'm staying home. No, that's great. And I've, I mean, you, like you've traveled before. Like when you're traveling a ton, it's mm -hmm. nice to not travel when everybody else is. Yes, it's yeah. great. It's like getting to school, getting to college a little early. Yeah. Just being like, oh, I just get to be here and not have to study. It's just a good experience. I was like really happy when the midterms ended. <coughs> Excuse me. I was really happy when the midterms ended. And then there were recounts. Then there were recounts. And you and had then, to, go back, and I had to go, go back on the road for the recounts. And I thought, wow, oh, they're, they're just stop enough. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about the fallout of the midterms, what it all means for the future of the Democratic Party. We're going to talk about Nancy Pelosi and her future in a segment we will eventually be called, calling What Happens to Nancy? Or Nancy Pelosi and her future. Or could, we could call that. You could that. subhead it. That. Yeah, we could do that too. I, yeah. There's all kinds of possibilities. Granted, I already did make the graphic open. We're going to talk about that. We're going we're to talk about the Green New Deal, hopefully, if there's time for that. Also, there are, there's an, a new hypocrisy that has emerged from the Trump world. Uh, will he admit that it is absolutely a hypocrisy or will he just talk past it at all uh, because it does affect his daughter? And... Uh, also, we're going to talk about uh, breaking news this morning about how a judge from San Francisco has put a stop to Trump's asylum-seeking ban. Uh, what are the implications of that? What are the legal grounds? What is the White House and the Justice Department arguing to justify uh, their claims? All that and more. But first, I just want to start with an update on, the, on one of three shootings that happened in America uh, yesterday. The, this one is the Chicago shooting at Mercy Hospital. Three people are dead, including a police officer and uh, two people that worked at the hospital. Uh, Tamara O'Neill, 38, an emergency room physician, has died. Uh, a pharmacy resident named Dana Less, who's 25 years old and recently graduated from uh, Purdue University. The residents are the ones who are like the youngest ones there um, doing their, their residency. Uh, officer Samuel Jimenez was the uh, officer who died. Essentially what happened on the day was there was an altercation between uh, a man, the shooter, and a woman with whom he was in a relationship. Uh, a friend tried to intervene. Essentially, uh, once that intervention had begun, the man showed that he had a gun and just started shooting. People called 911. People tried to take cover. And when the police got there, the gunman opened fire on the police before they were able to get out of their car um, but they advanced into uh, toward the shooter. There was an exchange of gunfire, and it is yet unclear whether the uh, 
the shooter was killed by his own bullet or by the police officers. But this was the, one of the, the headlines that I saw in my morning updates was this is one of three high profile shootings that happened in America. Yeah, there was one in Baltimore where a seven year old girl was shot, uh, her, or a, a young girl was shot. Her seven year old sister last year was killed by gunfire in Baltimore. Uh, this is a, a girl who was younger than seven. It doesn't stop. One of the encouraging things out of this election, which is, you know, it's not all about politics, but guns were an issue for the first time. Uh, in a long time. Chris Murphy, the senator from Connecticut, started his NR8, targeting eight races, raising a million dollars, went eight for eight. Uh, Florida gun uh, candidates, candidates who ran on guns, did pretty well there and around uh, and in California. There's a woman named Debbie Mukarcel Powell who, who, was, who lost her father to gunfight. Uh, to gunfire. Uh, she won a seat from Carlos Curbelo in Florida, uh, Lucy McBath in Georgia. People are starting to talk about it. So what was the difference? What, in your opinion? Well, I mean, the difference was Parkland. I think these kids, I think that was the, the main difference. Uh, that, that, that's the only thing that you can say changed. Uh, the difference between Newtown and Parkland was in Newtown, everyone was so young, right? Nobody could carry the torch. These were college-bound, you know, high schoolers, you know, purpose-driven, and they haven't stopped. Usually it stops. They have not stopped. It hasn't made that big a difference yet because they can't because it's an, a behemoth of an issue. But they are there everywhere and they don't stop. And I think that's pretty much the difference and why it's the politics are starting finally to if at least not trend toward gun control. They're tr trending away from just, you know, the gun rights people. Right. But, and then, but then I lo look at the fallout of what happened at the shooting in Thousand Oaks. It was an um, extended magazine that was made, le was made illegal that he still was able to get. Um, but oh, it's a long, I talked to a lot of people. I'm from that area. Yeah. And a lot of people were like, I went out and bought more guns. Right. That That's was, what happens. That's what happens. Uh, um, and the other last little detail before we move on is just the distinguishing the regular shootings from the high profile shootings. I thought right. that was an interesting framing that I saw in my update, in my one of the, a bunch of the headlines actually, three high profile shootings. Right. The fact that, like, you look at a shooting, you go, is that high profile enough? Uh, does it get the coverage for the 28 minutes that we will be covering these kinds of shootings in America because right. they're so frequent? No. Um, anyway, so uh, our hearts go out to the people affected, and really, in a way, that is everybody in America. So, um, yeah. We're going to move on to some uh, the, the news about the asylum ban. Um, a federal judge in San Francisco put a stop to Trump's attempted ban on people seeking asylum through areas that are not ports of entry in the United States. Uh, John Tigger is the name of the federal judge from San Francisco, and Tiggers are wonderful things. Uh huh. And Tigger, too. <laughs> Tigger, too. Yeah. Tops are made out of rubbers. <laughs> <laughs> a rubber. Their rubber. bottoms are made of. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the damage report, everybody. Sorry, John. Um, okay, so here is what the statement was. It said, whatever the scope of the president's authority, he may not rewrite the immigration laws to impose a condition that Congress has expressly forbidden, Tigger wrote in his opinion. Uh, asylum seekers will be put at increased risk of violence and other harms at the border and many will be deprived of meritorious asylum claims. That is the justification. The presidential proclamation originally came down November 9th, uh, and it barred migrants who crossed the border between ports of entry, essentially. Um, this, will, this stop will be, remain in effect through December 19th, when the court will consider arguments uh, on a more permanent ban. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, hey, listen, you already have conservatives saying that this is a liberal judge who put this in, and we should not have our laws made by judges. Well, look what this president has done. He's, uh, as any president would, crafted a court so that it would go into his favor. So he wants to make laws by, by putting the right judges in for what he wants. This is a totally reasonable uh, ruling, and it does, I mean, congressional decree states that what the president did was not right and not allowed, and asylum has always been part of our immigration law. And if you're going to change that, you change it through through Congress, so he can take it to the House of Representatives. But yeah, exactly, the <laughs> House of Representatives has recently, for those not paying attention for the last month, has recently flipped. So he really has it between now and when the gavel passes to make any kind of change that he- Exactly, and there are people intent in Congress, intent on doing this. Bob Goodlatte of, of, uh, of Virginia, who is retiring from Congress, the Republican, the very conservative Republican who had the Judici Judiciary Committee there, he wants very badly to, to do these sorts of things. Uh, it's gonna be tough to do in a late. Congress. So. Yes. Um, 
It's, sweeping legislation rarely happens. Sweeping legislation, and this is the kind of thing that you would, that they had hoped would happen. But the right. question is, how much of this was just absolute posturing from the president? We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic, or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. President, um, when we come back, we're going to show the way that the president was kind of uh, the president and Secretary Nielsen were characterizing the invasion from the south, and then updates to what actually happened to that surge on the border that you all heard so much about. Don't go away. More damage report after this. Welcome back to the damage report, everybody. Uh, we have some breaking news that is kind of taking over the, the world right now. Um, there has been an, a statement issued by President Trump regarding the revelations. Uh, and I guess the fallout from the CIA's conclusion that uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin, Mohammed bin Salman actually directly ordered the killing of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi em, embassy consulate in Turkey. And We've been reading during the break this statement, uh, laden with exclamation points from the president to kind of outline his positions because people weren't exactly sure what he was going to do. Was he going to, you know, really take into consideration the fact that a, a green, heart, green card holder from that lives in the United States, permanent resident of the United States, was killed um, by one ally in the con, in a consulate where he should have been safe? Um, here is the beginning of the statement made by President Trump. And again, this just happened, so we don't have graphics for it. Bear with me as I read it. Um, this is a statement from President Donald J. Trump on standing with Saudi Arabia. So that's where it starts. The next line is just America first, exclamation point. The world is a very dangerous place, exclamation point. The country of Iran, as an example, is responsible for a bloody proxy war against Saudi Arabia in Yemen, trying to destabilize Iraq's fragile attempt at democracy, supporting the terror group Hezbollah in Lebanon, propping up dictator Bashar al-Assad in Syria, who has killed millions of his own citizens, and much more. And then he goes on the other, uh, he says, after, on the other hand, Saudi Arabia would gladly withdraw from Yemen if the Iranians would agree to leave. He then says, after my heavily negotiated trip to Saudi Arabia last year, the kingdom agreed to spend and invest $450 billion in the United States. This is a record amount of money. So essentially making explicit, from my read of it, what he had kind of been hinting at all along, which is, yes, someone died, but the world's a very dangerous place. And I have a lot more to think about. By the way, here's $450 billion in military equipment that we are selling to Saudi Arabia. Right, and I mean, it's uh, it, when he opens it with America first. That has nothing to do with any of this. Uh, he did say one line that I think is is pretty compelling. We may never know all of the facts surrounding the murder of Mr. Jamal Khashoggi. In any case, our relationship is with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They have been a great ally. Uh, we know all the facts we need <laughs> to know, uh, and the CIA, who we employ to 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 glean those facts has told us what happened there at the CIA, we know. Michael, you are misunderstanding. Let me parse this sentence. Would you do we that for may me, never Brent? Know. That would be good. I'm glad know, you're here. Yeah. Listen, you travel the country. You clearly know a lot more than I do. But I will say the we is not 
a, a plural. It's the royal we. Oh, the royal we. the we. president may never know. Well, we the royal family of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, and, and the reason we, the president and all, all his, his subjects will never know is because he refuses to learn those right. things. Uh, it's not in his interest to learn. Um, I feel like there are people who are, I always try to think of not just the avid Trump supporter, but think of the person, because I've had conversations with Trump supporters who say, listen, I don't like him very much. I've talked to military veterans who have said, I wouldn't want to work for the guy. Um, but they also say like, the economy's doing fine, and I don't really think he means all that, I think it's just posturing. In this situation, it seems like he's trying to appeal to people who say, listen, you don't care. You don't right. care what's really happening. Um, what is he gonna do, stand up for a journalist that works for the Washington Post in, in their minds? He goes after the Washington Post all the time. Yeah. And the, the more he, he's gonna counter your freedom of the press with freedom of speech, just like the canned alt-right version of his freedom of speech, and then go on to say, yeah, I'm creating jobs for you. Um, and then he mentions not just the $45 billion, but he says hundreds of thousands, or however much it was, $450 billion, but also the hundreds of thousands of jobs that he's going to create. Right. But what should people take from this? I think that they should take exactly what is. It, it's so plainly obvious, except to the people that support him, what is going on here. And it is, it is complete transparency on Saudi Arabia and our relationship with Saudi Arabia. The well-chronicled and historical didn't start with Donald Trump, Clearly not going to end with Donald Trump. Uh, but the way that he frames this and, and those people that you are talking about that we've all met many of who say they support Trump, oh, but I wish he wouldn't tweet or I really don't like the way he, I wouldn't want to work for him as your friend. Those are, listen, Hillary Clinton said one of the most politically tone deaf and truest things when she called them deplorables. Um, it was a stupid thing to do if you're running for president, but it's, yeah. it's exactly right. It is deplorable, I, it's selfish, but I, I definitely get it. It's a political calculation where for better or for worse. But this is the people. murder of an American in, a, in an embassy, a foreign embassy, and to just look the other way, which is what this statement seems to imply he's doing. That's, that's, um, that's impossible. To do if you're the president, it so should what's, be impossible. What's to the do. right solution? Well, the right solution would be to pursue this, and, and congressional committees will do it. But to pursue it in the proper way, as you would pursue anything in the precedent that, that American politics dictates, and then punish the people that did this, right? Um, and not just coddle to them because they happen to be a, a rare ally in a dysfunctional part of the world. And that's the issue for me, is this seems like Saudi Arabia knowing they can act with impunity because they have us by the short and curlies to put it in something that I'm pretty sure the president would probably say. Right. Is they just look at us and say, oh, what are you gonna do? And yeah. that's the weakness that Trump called out in pretty much every world leader, every American leader that he felt like wasn't him, and so he, he could go after. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. And it does allow people to, and, and listen, the whole world is allowing this MBS to go, Mohammed bin Salman to go on with impunity. Saudi Arabia is allowing it to happen. I mean, he's really just come run roughshod through the royal family and through what they have been doing politically, to the point where there were even rumors that he was going to involve Israel in, in discussions, which, which Trump liked. Uh, so there, there are reasons diplomatically why you would have wanted to do it, but he broke that. You know? Right, From, in my perspective, Trump is a savvy media personality going up against savvy diplomats. Mm -hmm. and savvy world leaders who have come to power through much more difficult terrain than he has been able to, or at least a completely different one that, you know, these are people who have been dealing with American leaders for a very long time. Yeah. And what Trump thinks is his dominant strategy, which is just always be strong, never admit that you're wrong. Um, others see as this is a person who is super vain. We will cater to every vain instinct that he has. Tell him that he's being very powerful. Oh, great job. They look at Donald Trump the way that Donald Trump looked at Kanye West when Kanye West was sitting across the table from him. Just right. like the, this guy is- Be amused. Yeah. yeah, okay. But you look at him and say, very smart, very intelligent, good call. Um, that's the update on that. I did want to go back to just a quick update on the asylum seekers. Um, just the way that the president was talking about the border in the lead up to this. He said the mayor of Tijuana just started that city, stated that 
The city is ill prepared to handle this many migrants. The backlog could last six months. Likewise, the US is ill prepared for this invasion and will not stand for it. They are causing crime and big problems in Mexico. Go home. Kirsten Nielsen tweeted this AM. This was on the 19th, a couple days ago. All of San Ysidro port of entries, northbound lanes were temporarily closed to initiate additional port hardening efforts. Officials were notified that a large number of caravan migrants were planning to rush the border in an attempt to gain legal access on the US. And, and she, showed, she tweeted pictures of what the border looks like. And I think this really sums up what they want to portray. It is pictures of men in battle helmets with, uh, you know, essentially- Are those East Germans? Those are, <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like, right? Yeah. And when you look into the reports of what uh, army representatives, what military representatives were sent to the border, it was most of them, according to reports from uh, various uh, people who were overseeing those efforts, was they're done. They went home. They that was their job. Yeah. Their sole responsibility, this surge of power, showing that people are not allowed to come to the United States. That surge of power was simply to set up barricades. To set up to take you know dividers out of the middle of the highway and put them at the border and then wrap like props from World War II documentaries, right? Or props from World War II movies and put them up there like that. Yeah, and that's what he's trying to sell. I mean, it's it's strange to me that he didn't do this before the election. Uh, that this that this sort of uh, this movement happened after the election rather than before is curious to me because that, that was a misstep. If that was the the hand he was playing, it was a misstep. Which movement? In other words, going to the border in this way. I mean, talking about the caravan is one thing, but he could have done. It was all a charade. This mm-hmm. is a charade too. He could have done this part of the charade, you know, uh, on October twenty eighth, and maybe to greater effect. Right. All right. Uh, we are going to take. A break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, Trump's hypocrisy. He won't admit it the week. We'll come back. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Damage Report. I'm Brett Ehrlich. In for John Iderola. We still have Michael Shore here. It's in for Michael Shore. In for yeah, no, no. There's no regular Tuesday guest. No. So how are you coping? Do you have a regular? Are there regular guests uh, day of the by the day of the week? Monday. Thanks for watching the show. First of all. Uh, it's been a long. I just can't keep them all together. Nope, that's you, no, no. Nice like try. I don't know what day. I didn't know it was regular. Okay. Monday's Brooke. Brooke. Wednesday's Monday, Jr. Jr.'s on Wednesday. Friday's typically me, unless anyone right. more important shows up. Right. And then I go back in the control room. Anyways, um, here's a story that we wanted to cover, just because it's like so delightfully ironic, and the irony is not uh, lost on us, but it is lost on pretty much everyone that supports Donald Trump. Uh, This is a story that we like to call uh, Trump's uh, hypocrisy he won't admit of the week. So that's our our favorite (laughs) part of the show, yeah. yeah. Uh, So- I've seen that on other shows. That, yeah, that's- On other damage reports. Oh yeah, that one, hypocrisy. Yeah. No, well, it's the first time we've done. That's it. what I mean. <laughs> this one, <laughs> I was kidding. It's a, this story is about Ivanka Trump uh, and her emails. You've heard Hillary Clinton. Oh, the email, the private email server. She's using her own emails. What's with her damn emails and and but her emails. Here is a story that involves Ivanka Trump. It turns out that for a long time she sent thousands and received uh, over a thousand emails. Um, or at least hundreds of emails using her personal account when she should be using uh, her White House account. And those emails detailed certain events, logistical arrangements. Um, Here is a statement about it. While transitioning into government after she was given an official account, but until the White House provided her the same guidance they had given others who started before she did, according to her spokesman for her lawyer, Miss Trump sometimes used her personal account almost always for logistics and scheduling concerning her family. Ms. Trump, they say, did not create a private server in her house or office. No classified information was ever included. The account was never transferred to Trump at Trump organization, and no emails were ever deleted. That said, according to reports, this definitely violates uh, what is it like federal records rules? Yeah, and. Do you think Trump will ever acknowledge that there is anything? He never will. He'll say, what he'll say is, "This is you're talking about my daughter versus the Secretary of State who did this, even though Colin Powell did it before him. 
One thing, I don't have a problem with what Ivanka Trump did. I think yeah. it's a silly thing. But the precedent that has been set by the hypocrisy uh, of, of using it, and to great effect, by the way, because he had the media in the palm of his hand, and the media did a terrible job with the email story. I mean, they just they carried it for weeks and weeks when it was really not much of a story. And there was, uh, and there was evidence of other people having done it, not just Secretary Clinton at that time. Yes, I, I, the thing about it is like these are logistical. But by emails. the way, when it comes to Ivanka, well, lock her up. Lock her up. That's what he'll say. Lock her up. Yeah, he'll say lock, lock her, her up. up. Anyways, I just thought that was an interesting little story that came through the media. Uh, and it's just, it's your daughter. And obviously he's not gonna say anything about it. Right, her daughter who may be you know, married to future uh, felon. Jared Kushner, according to Robert Mueller. We so covered the potential, when people were listing potential people, well, potential people to uh, replace Jeff Sessions, someone said Chris Christie, and then just the delightful irony that Chris Christie had locked up Jared Kushner's dad, <laughs> yeah. like literally. Um, anyways, okay, so I wanna talk about the relationship between the press and the White House. Uh, there are new rules coming out of the White House. Uh, uh, you know, you may have been following that Jim Acosta lost his press credential because he didn't give a microphone back to an intern. Um, but a judge ordered that that press credential be returned to Jim Acosta. Uh, on giving back his press credentials, the White House also issued four new rules for White House press conferences. Here they are. One, a journalist called upon to ask a question will ask a single question and then will yield the floor to other journalists. Two, at the discretion of the president or other White House official taking questions, a follow-up question or questions may be permitted. And where a follow-up has been allowed and asked, the questioner will then yield the floor. Three, yielding the floor includes, when applicable, surrendering the microphone to White House staff for use by the questioner. And then four, which isn't a rule, but rather consequences, failure to abide by any of these rules, just in case you forgot which ones they were, one through three, <laughs> may result in suspension or revocation of the journalist's hard pass. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, they, they say, all right, let's not challenge, uh, let's not challenge Acosta, but let's really get him when he comes back to work, right? And and basically, the, the, the one is. Uh, Jim Acosta, is the president uh, upset about the way things are going on the border? No. Next, you know, just one word answers to Jim Acosta, and that's the game I think they're playing here. Yeah, that's absolutely the game yeah. they're playing. It is so, like, I've watched so many press con White House press conferences because we did a segment, which you should go back and watch, called Honest Answers, uh, if the White House told the truth, and where I just watched it. Yeah. First of all, the microphone thing. There isn't a microphone in the White House press room. All those Sarah Sanders ones you see, there are no microphones. So there's no microphone yielding. The only time there is a microphone to yield or not yield is literally in this uh, Jim Acosta video that started it all. So it's a weird thing yeah. that one third of your rules apply to something that happens one thirtieth of the time. Um, and, and also one, one other thing, because I've now spent a good deal of time in that press room for these Sarah Sanders press conferences and others. So what happens is you'll see two reporters say, or you know, it's just, oh, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. like that. There's, there's this sort of, you know, I'm going to ask this question, not necessarily about the subject or what the question is, but then it's, I'm going to ask one more on top of that, and then I'll get to you. You know, that, so they, they work together to get what the information they need. And in my experience watching it, I notice that people, when they follow up after, say, let's say you ask a question, I noticed that if your follow-up is a stupid follow-up, yeah. then the next person in line will start asking their question. Yeah. But if your follow-up fits with exactly sure. what journalists are sent there and seek to do, then I'll wait. Right. And that happens. These problems that they're saying are problems are not problems. And there have been previous White House administrations that have played things extraordinarily close to the jet, the yeah. best. I'm talking Ari Fleischer, that's his name, Ari? Yeah, Ari Fleischer. Ari Fleischer, who was a White House press uh, guy for George W. Bush. They answered questions. They didn't give any information. No, no, I mean, they, they were good. And Sarah Sanders isn't necessarily bad, except that she lies a lot more. But, but they would say, that's something I can't talk about. The president, the president has said what the president's going to say. You know, things like that. That's what people like Larry Speaks and, and Ari Fleischer and, and uh, you know, Mike McCurry, all those people that were in the, the sort of last generation of, of, of uh, press people would do. They would say, hey, uh, you know, the president spoke on this. There's really not much more I can offer.
Right. That's how they would get out of it, instead of making up some ramble or politicizing it to a great degree. They all politicize it a little bit, to be fair, but not like the way this woman does. Last thing, we don't want to go too far into it. There, the White House Correspondents Association announced that they will not be having a comedian perform at the White House press dinner. What do you think about that? I mean, I think it's, uh, listen, I, people love to make fun of the White House Correspondents Association dinner. I think it's fun. I like it. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry there's not going to be a comedian because part of it is the comedian is funny. I also think it means that Trump won. I mean, not always funny. Uh, it's, it, but, it, but it's funny to have it be sort of jocular on that night. And the president is often funny, too. And uh, I think this means Trump won temporarily, though. Yeah, uh, we, I, I beg to differ. You don't think that this guy uh, that they announced, Ron Chernow, his, pr- his famed biographer, let's just, let's just listen in. Let's listen in on a, a, a video of, of Chernow delivering some of his gassers at, uh, I believe it's like the West 79th Y. Born in 1822, he's born uh, Hiram Ulysses Grant, which uh, saddled him with the unfortunate initials hug. H-U-G. The boys teased him mercilessly, so he dropped the Hiram and he became just plain Ulysses. <laughs> this guy's good at slay. That's really good, man. That's hug. Uh, hug. <laughs> Where's the S? Uh, he did write the, the Hamilton biography. I've read, actually, a George Washington biography he wrote. He's good. Uh, he's not funny. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but he wrote the Hamilton biography that inspired Lin-Manuel Miranda to create Hamilton. So there's some sort of... You know, and now he has this whole line of, here's my shtick, you know, and nobody's going to laugh. So he could probably have fun with that. Yeah, it won't be that much fun. No. Hopefully, we're keeping our fingers crossed for some kind of uh, performance by Lynn Manuel Miranda. <laughs> uh, don't go away. We're going to talk about Nancy Pelosi and her future after this. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, The midterms just happened. The Democrats are poised to take control of the House of Representatives, but who will be the speaker? Many accounts point to Nancy Pelosi, but there has been a recent development uh, that we will cover now in our segment that we call, What Happens to Nancy? Fantastic. Okay, so the what most- What was your favorite episode of What Happens to Nancy? I, I, Do you know what What Happened to Nancy N- is? Nancy Walker was what I liked when she was the bounty woman who was on <laughs> Macmillan and Wife. That was a great episode we did. I've never seen Macmillan and Wife, <laughs> though I am aware of it, Family Guy reference. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, good for you. Uh, so Nancy, back to what really tangibly yeah. affects everyone's daily life in America. Who will be the next Speaker of the House? Uh, will it be the once and future Speaker of the House? We do not know. Uh, but there were a number of Democrats who signed a letter recently. And the full background on that is there were supposed to be many, many Democrats, or at least more than 11 sitting Congress people and five Congress people elect who signed this letter, two of whom have not actually been declared the winners of their races as of yesterday anyway. Um, how do you, fascinating, how do you write a letter like this? that issues your uh, position opposing the potential leader, the Speaker of the House. They say, we are thankful to Leader Pelosi for her years of service to our country and of our caucus. She is a historic figure whose leadership has been instrumental to some of our party's most important legislative achievements. However, we also recognize that it is our recent, that in this recent election, Democrats ran and won on a message of change. Our majority came on the backs of, of candidates who said that we would support new leadership because voters in hard-won districts and across the country want to see real change in Washington. We promise to change the status quo. We intend to deliver on that promise. Therefore, we are committed to voting for new leadership in both our caucus meeting and on the floor. Not enough people, however, in the 16 that signed. No, 16 people, a good number of people. They promise more. There are people like Connor Lamb, who won in Pennsylvania, Abigail Spamberger, who won in Virginia, who said when they get to the floor, they're not going to sign a letter, but when they get to the floor, they're not going to support Pelosi. Does I mean, you know, you still have about 95% of the caucus saying that they're going to support Pelosi, and there are lots of uh, sort of procedural moves that could make it happen as well, meaning that there are people who could vote 
uh, who could choose not to vote. That brings down the threshold of the number she would need to win. So tell me about the, I'm gonna list the people uh, right now, Anthony Brandisi, Jim Cooper, Joe Cunningham, Bill Foster, Bill Higgins, uh, Brian Higgins, Stephen Lynch, Ben McAdams, Seth Moulton, uh, Ed Perlmutter, Kathleen Rice, Max Rose, Tim Ryan, Linda Sanchez, uh, Kurt Schrader, Jeff Von Drew, and Philemon Vela. Those are the names of the people who signed it. Right. Who are they? Well, Ben McAdams in Utah hasn't officially won. That, right. That's still seesawing. He's in the 4th District of Utah trying to beat Mia Love, the incumbent there. Um, if he wins, uh, it's an unsafe district, and that makes him a rare person on this list because everyone else is from a very, very safe district. And Jim Cooper in Nashville to Seth Moulton in Massachusetts to Brian Higgins in New York. All of these people, Philemon Vela, can win till he's done being in Congress in Texas. But a lot of them are people who could be ripe for a primary because a lot of them, um, I mean, Jim Cooper and Seth Moulton are kind of moderate Democrats. And those are the type of Democrats that these, this new generation of Democrats that they refer to in this letter, they're the type of people that they, they primary, that they challenge. Right, but is it one of those misery creates strange bedfellows kinds of thing? Acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. Like, is it one of those issues where these two do not agree with not having Pelosi for different reasons? Yeah, I think, well, there's some people that do. Some people ran on it. Some people ran on it with a wink and a nod from Pelosi, too, who said, do what you have to do to win. We need a majority. You say anything you want about me, I'd love to see the word congressman before you, right? Mm -hmm. So, so don't worry about that. Then, and then, and some of those people are now saying that they may support her, you know. But, and, uh, right, but that's the, isn't that the kind of stuff that just angers people like crazy? Um, like that is the kind well, of disingenuous po political behavior. But that's politics, that's the business they're in. That's the, you know, it's a trade-off business, all politics, you and, know. And so, so it, it, is it disingenuous? I, I don't know. I mean, there, some of these people said, that they think that there's, without saying, I'm not going to vote for Nancy Pelosi, I think there needs to be change in leadership. That's vague. You can still think there should be change in leadership. The average age is in the high 70s of the three leaders in Congress. The youngest one was the one that was defeated by Alexander, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. He was 56. And, and he, you know, so he was the youngest by about 20 years in that leadership, and they thought he was too old. So there has to be some kind of a change. There may or may not be. Pelosi has said she wants to be a transitional leader. This is when she should transition. The other thing is she's done a magnificent job in these two years as the minority leader by keeping, of keeping her caucus together. It's very, very difficult to do that. They could have strayed in many different directions. Hurting cats is, is really what it's like to be the Democratic leader because they all go off in different directions. Even Paul Ryan, where there's much more sort of homogeneity in his caucus, mm -hmm. had a tough time doing that. Pelosi's done a good job. There was a recent CBS poll out that asked uh, Demo uh, well, asked everybody really, but here is the result among Democrats who they think should be the next Speaker of the House. Nancy Pelosi got 49%, just under 50. Um, someone else said, or 40% said another Democrat, and 10% said don't know. Here's the thing with- This is Democrats. This is among it. Democrats. Yeah, right. So uh, the other numbers are, uh, I don't know, I don't have them in front of me. Oh, uh, Republicans said that they want, 12% want Pelosi, 76% uh, said another Democrat. Independents said, 27% 20, of independents said they want Pelosi, 58% said they want another Democrat. So of independents, 58% said they, they would like to see another Democrat. Is this? It's, it's a dumb poll. I personally dumb think it's a dumb poll. It doesn't matter. First of all, it's 435 people are the representatives who are elected. They get to decide the 235 or so Democrats will decide. But And it doesn't matter. It's a flash poll. It's too easy out of nowhere to start saying, what do you think of Nancy Pelosi? If, this, if there was a trend to this polling, then that would be something to look at. The one thing that, that jumped out to me is there – to me, is a is the same issue arises with this as there does with the presidential field. Like who, if not Nancy, then who? Other Democrat. 
I mean, if right. it was, other Democrat is doing great, right. rel given that other Democrat does not have a name. Well, that's a really important thing in this case, because there's no one who's come forward. Marsha Fudge has been floated as a possibility. Now CBS is reporting that she had, you know, she advocated on, on behalf of somebody who was, you know, a, a, a ne'er-do-well um, with a letter to try and, and get somebody who'd done some bad things um, a, a lighter sentence. I think that when you, you, you make a great point, you've got to have an alternative. There's nobody running against her. She's going to win in the caucus next week in tw on the 28th. Then when it gets to the floor, that's when it could be a little bit tougher and a little bit different. I can't, I don't think she's going to lose the speakership. All right. Um, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we might talk a little bit more about this, but we might also talk about Martha Stewart and her Uber ride. Granted that we're talking about something that has to do with the future of America. We might just talk a little more about this. Welcome back to the Damage Report, everybody. Brett Ehrlich still in for John Iderola, and Michael Shore joins us uh, for the remainder of this show. Can I give a follow-up on the Khashoggi thing? Please uh, do. Uh, Eamon Javers uh, from CNBC is saying the White House press office is not responding to questions about, about the apparent discrepancy between the CIA's reported assessment that MBS ordered the Khashoggi murder and the president's statement that, quote, unquote, maybe he did and maybe he didn't even know about the murder. So uh, the White House is being mum on this after the president spoke or released a statement. This is a more holistic thing about uh, America in general and how they talk about tribalism in being folks are blind to the other side. I've seen like, oh, yeah. we got our blinders onto the other side. I'm shrinking in my chair. That was funny. Thank you. It's comedy. <laughs> It's that's embarrassing. That's a Ron Chernow stick. It's total Ron Chernow stick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's slightly different. I think everyone knows exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. No one's blind to it. It's right. just they're accepting the, it at a, t at a rate that they never accepted it before. No, I think it's like what Trump does. He knows. Oh, Trump right, is ignorant to all, but he knows. He just has decided that the only way through this is to refuse to admit certain things to the other side. And but that's part of the accept. But there are people that accept that in a right. leader that have never accepted that before. But it seems like it's following by example. There's no way that everyone can be like, listen, I believe him. I like I see right. Emma at these things. Emma, if you don't watch Emma Vigeland go to for her Rebel HQ videos, go to uh, these Trump rallies and see people that look her in the eye and say, I believe Trump for every mm -hmm. hypocrisy and inconsistency. I think they just would rather die than admit that he's an idiot. Right. Well, I think so too, but I think that they sort of they believe it, well, people believe what they want to believe to a degree, and that's part of tribalism. Yeah. Um, here's something. Just one last thing about the Nancy Pelosi discussion. Something that I've seen recently is a lot of folks who say that um, Nancy Pelosi, if you oppose her, there's somehow sexism baked into that. Here's a video of uh, Whoopi Goldberg on the View that you may have seen, but I want to talk about it with Michael. So take a look. Reportedly, some of the newly elected female Democrats are part of a so-called pink wave who are questioning whether Nancy Pelosi should be Speaker of the House. Mm. Uh, they say, you know, she, she's too old, she should step aside and let the new folks. So, okay. Yeah. If you're going to be the new folks, you also need to do your homework. Let's take it, for example, a Nancy Pelosi or a Dianne Feinstein. Two women mm -hmm. battling and still in at work. Right. Battling their male counterparts on both sides. You know, some of y'all calling yourselves, uh, uh, what was it? It's something crazy. Not crazy, but it really kind of freaked me out. Justice Democrats. So I know. Oh. That. So let me just be really clear, because you kind of, on your site, you kind of take a little punch at people. So my question is this. You know, uh, are you saying that other Democrats who've been fighting for 25, 30 years aren't justice Democrats? So this is, I just want to say, I don't think it's sexist not to want Nancy Pelosi, especially because a lot of people that are put forward after it are female. Right, but I, it depends on who you are. Uh, well, nobody's being put forward after it, really. I mean, there's no real anybody being put forward. Marsha Fudge has flirted with the idea, mm -hmm. but it's not like everybody's saying Marsha Fudge right. do that. As a matter of fact, she was the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congressional Black Caucus has said they're supporting Nancy Pelosi. So mm -hmm. there's nobody even sort of proffering her as as uh, just the fact that her name came up makes people say, oh, there's somebody, right? right. But there is something sexist about the way the opposition uses these women, whether it's Nancy Pelosi in ads all across the mm -hmm. country, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, 
it's obviously why Donald Trump said nice things about Nancy Pelosi. Keep her there so we can use her in that way. That is sexist. Powerful women uh, as a tool for Republicans running for office, powerful women on the other side, they think is effective. That's sexist. Right, but then for her to pivot immediately to the Justice Democrats. Well, I, I, you know, I, I listen, I, I understand what she's saying to a degree. I don't, I don't know that I would have said it the same way. But the idea that if you are not a Justice Democrat means that you don't care about the things that are being espoused by Justice Democrats. Justice Democrats, to me, is more of a strategy. She didn't know that. It's more of a strategy than it is a labeling of every Democrat. Right, but she just kind of Black Lives Matter, All Lives Mattered it. Herself, where it's like, no, she we, did do that. our priority is justice. That's we true. She did do she that, did that, which is, but but there is there is a, a frustration to, that some people have who you know who do believe certain things that the Justice Democrats think that's that are true. being put aside. We have to go. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks to Michael Thanks. Short. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.